Good morning. Good morning. How's it going? All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is CIET 101 lecture for September the 4th. Uh, we are in chapter two and actually it shouldn't take too long this morning to uh, to get through chapter two. I'm going to uh, put the notes back up just to make sure everyone kind of sees where we are. So uh, you should be able to see um, the notes. And uh, somebody give me a thumbs up, Kristen, if you guys can see that. Okay, good. All right, so uh, what we've gone over, are, we were talking about some common tests with uh, aggregates. And I think last time would be Wednesday in class, we just had, uh, just had enough time to go over the uh, specific gravity equations uh, for a fine aggregate. And uh, so we need to kind of go over the specific gravity for coarse aggregate. And uh, it's, it's, mine doesn't show up on this slide, but you have it in your notes. And uh, I can pull that up as well. Okay. So you should be able to see um, see those notes. All right. So uh, right here. Oop, there we go. Hopefully you guys are seeing that. So when we do this test, uh, this will be, I guess since we don't have class on Monday, this will be uh, the Monday following. It's a little bit late for a discussion, but you know, you either have the lab first or discuss it or you discuss it and then have the lab. But so what we're going to do is we're going to actually take a coarse aggregate gravel and um, we're going to actually, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do this before class, but I'll actually take an oven dry it. Um, and then I will saturate it in a bowl, okay, in one of those metal bowls, and, uh, and it'll sit there, I depend on what I do, usually it's 24 hours at least, and it'll be completely saturated. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to decant the water uh, off of it, so that when you come in, um, whereas for the fine aggregate, we had to do the cone test, for the coarse aggregate, it's coarse enough that you'll just, I'll give you a, a towel or a rag, and and you'll actually manually dry the aggregate so that you can see. So it's just a visible uh, test or check, if you would. You can see that it is surface dry. Now, obviously you can't see the saturated, but you know it was saturated. And so that's how we get. And so then you'll weigh out, um, I forget, but maybe like a kilogram of that material. So, so that will be your, um, saturated surface dry weight. So if you see SSD in this formula, any of these formulas right here for the, for the course, um, that's, that's where that'll come from. The next thing you see in the formulas for the course is you'll see a, a sub or a submerged weight. So the way that we actually do this is uh, we, we place the material in a wire uh, basket, W-I-R-E, uh, wire basket and we submerge it. So I actually hang it from the bottom of a scale in a water tub, and we actually get a submerged weight. So it, it's not really that difficult to do if you have the basket and you have the scale set up. So, so that would take care of this one. Um, and we already got this one. And then you transfer the contents out of the wire basket into back into a bowl and put it in the oven and you, you dry it all, you know, you dry it out. So that would be uh, your oven dried weight. So uh, these formulas here that you see for, for coarse aggregate, um, they would be, here's, here's the second one. So this is bulk specific gravity. This is saturated surface dry basis. So it's just slightly different, but easy equation. And this is a parent specific gravity. So you got oven dry weight and submerged weight. And that's basically it. Uh, and then the only thing left is the, uh, for coarse aggregate, is the percent absorption. And it's the same formula as for fine aggregate. You just get the numbers a little different way. So you still got your saturated surface dry weight and your oven dried weight, and you multiply that by 100. So that's basically it. Um, the procedure 
for both uh, coarse aggregate and fine aggregate are in your text. I recommend you reading over those. I think it may be like a bulleted list. Uh, they're on page 72, 73 for the coarse aggregate and 73, 74 for the fine aggregate. All right, does anybody have any questions on that part, on the equations? Okay. Um, and I, I, Tony, I know you weren't here Wednesday, but uh, the report for the fine aggregate will be due uh, that Monday that we get back. So uh, you might want to get with uh, somebody or me or, you know, and uh, kind of go make sure you know what's expected of, on the report. Um, we can do that next week. I know we won't have class Monday, but we can probably uh, set up something or and get you the information you need on that. Okay. Good. All right. So let's get back to our notes. Just a few minutes here. So if you have your uh, notes, we'll continue on with that. All right. All right, you should be able to see uh, another slide that says common tests, toughness, soundness, and hydrophilic. Somebody give me a thumbs up if that's what you got on your screen. Okay, good. All right, <clears throat> so um, these are not as common as, as the ones we've already covered. So, you know, we've already covered uh, percent finer or passing the number 200 sieve, and um, we've already covered um, the dry sieve analysis, and we've already covered the specific gravity test, both, both for coarse and fine aggregate. So those are, uh, are pretty common. These are a little more obscure, but um, toughness may be something that um, you would be interested in if your aggregate uh, needs to be able to resist impact or abrasion. And, I mean, if, even in concrete or asphalt, it would need to have some amount of toughness. So you wouldn't want to use like a, a weathered shale or something like that. I mean, typically aggregates in our area are either limestone or sandstone. Um, and so that, you know, that's, that's a very sturdy, uh, geologically very sturdy rock material. <clears throat> um, I think there may be a picture in just a little bit or, or in the slides, but they actually uh, have more like a, a, a tumbler that has steel balls in it and uh, it, it tests the impact resistance or toughness of, we don't have that in the lab, but the toughness of an aggregate. Uh, soundness is very similar to that. It's just basically how well the aggregate holds up under, under weather. So once again, you know, shale is probably the best example. It, it just kind of uh, decomposes or disintegrates into soil. Um, so obviously it wouldn't be a good, a good rock to use in any type of structural application or road base or bedding or anything like that. Um, Hydrophilic is kind of a very obscure one if you ask me. But we don't really have that around here, but as you can see by definition, aggregates that do not maintain adhesion to asphalt after becoming wet. Um, I wish I could give you a good example there, but it's basically just, uh, you know, inhibits the bond between the asphalt and uh, the aggregate itself. I don't know that they, it's such a thing for concrete uh, with the cement, but uh, with the asphalt, I guess in certain parts of the country, they might have that. All right, let's talk a little bit about sampling. I alluded to this, I think on Wednesday, but um, you can have a specification and you can do whatever tests you're gonna, you know, wanting to perform or need to perform and it fail not because uh, the aggregate was the wrong aggregate, but because you didn't get a representative sample. So, uh, you know, this, th there, are, there are methods and the state has methods of random sampling and, or, and representative sampling. A good example, uh, I think I mentioned the other day, if you have a large stockpile of uh, even sand, but think about gravel, because you can kind of see the particle size uh, differentiations. If you have a, a large stockpile and you, you just go and take a five gallon bucket and you, you, you fill the bucket with what's right on the bottom. Well, I mean, typically your, your larger or heavy particles will kind of uh, segregate 
and roll down further. So you may get a very non-representative sample uh, like that. The same thing could be true if you were just sampling on the top of something. So, you know, you, you want to make sure that as far as when you're obtaining your sample, that there is some effort put into obtaining a representative sample. Um, when the state, uh, when they do density tests, like in asphalt, things like that, and we'll talk about this in, when we get to chapter three, but they actually have a procedure um, where, whereby they go, you know, it's a, it's a random thing where they go down the profile, you could say, or with the road so far, and then they go off the center to the left or off the center to the right so many feet, and it's a truly random selection. Uh, you know, I've got an app on my phone that you can put a random number or you can do it in Excel, and, uh, you know, random number between one and a hundred or whatever. That, so, you know, things like that help us to not be biased or um, not lean toward you know, one group of uh, an aggregate or a sample um, population, but yet try to, you know, get something good that represents the entire bunch. Um, I'm going to show you a couple things you can do in lab after you kind of obtain your sample. And uh, I actually did this for you, for your saying, um, fine aggregate before uh, I, I actually put it in the, the bins that you all got it out of. But the, the next note is just to make sure you avoid segregation. So I mentioned that, that, you know, when they're stockpiling material, they can't hardly avoid segregation. But what we do in the lab uh, and even what we do, well, we'll talk about this in, when we talk about placing concrete is we want to, as much as possible, avoid segregation. So avoid that separation of uh, larger stone from smaller stone or sand or whatever aggregate we're dealing with. All right, so here's here's one way we can do, and these are uh, typically used for fine aggregate, but we've also, we've, I, I can show you this in the lab, we've got one of these for coarse aggregate as well, but these are just called splitters. And in particular here, this is called a riffle splitter. And um, basically you just take your entire sample. So if you, if you went somewhere and got a five gallon bucket or whatever, and you need to, uh, you only need, you know, two pounds of it or something like that. What you would do is you would keep uh, introducing this into the top of the riffle splitter. And if you take your hands and kind of do them like this, uh, that's kind of what's happening here. So the aggregate's going in and part of it's going one way and the other half is going the other way. And so if you put 10 pounds into the feed chute up there, you could see, um, you know, half of it would go to one side and half of it would go to the other. So then you would, you would um, discard half or take half away and then you basically put another bin in the bottom and you can split it again. And so you just keep splitting the sample until you reduced it down to the size that you would need for the test. So that's, that's just kind of how that, how that works. Uh, another way to do it, and this is typically done for coarse aggregate, and I'll have you guys do this when we, uh, when we do concrete, is you can just place it on the floor or on a tarp if you don't wanna, you know, if it's not a good hard, clean surface. You, if you're outside, you'd need a tarp or something. And then you, you heap it up, like kind of mix it up, heap, heap, mix, mix like that. And then you, then you quarter it. Um, and then you, you reject opposite quarters and you keep opposite quarters. So the same kind of thing's going on. So you're basically keeping half of it and, and, and discarding half of it. And then you would, you would continue to do that until once again, until you get it down to the size that uh, you were looking for, for whatever you were testing. So that's a couple different ways that uh, you could do that. And there, the next slide you can see there is a picture of uh, how you do that with a tarp or blanket or something like that. All right. So uh, that's a little bit on representative sampling and uh, the importance of it to make sure one thing that, uh, and I'll mention this again when we when we get to the test on coarse aggregate, because what I'll do is I'll I'll ask you to determine whether or not uh, the coarse aggregate that we test meets the specification for, let's say, a 57 stone, and and then I'll ask you if it doesn't meet for 57 stone, does it meet for any stone size? So there's lots of different ASTM stone sizes. And sometimes, you know, I've done this a long time, sometimes I'll have student groups that they'll, 
they'll say that their test results, and maybe rightly so, don't meet any of the um, specifications. So then I kind of want you to think about that for a second. Do you think that the quarry would produce, mass produce, stone sizes that don't meet specifications? The answer is no. They, they wouldn't do that. It just wouldn't be a product that they'd be able to sell. Because when the state or, or whomever they're selling to, when you buy stone, you would you tell them, you know, hey, I want 57 stone or I want 67 or number ones or number eights or whatever. So, you know, they're testing that at the quarry. So then what's the problem? How come we, you know, if I go down to Citizens and get our stone, that's the Citizens Building Supply, uh, you know, I'm buying 57 or 67 stone, but yet when it gets, in the time I get it to the lab, you're telling me that it doesn't meet the specification. Well, it's all about sampling. So, you know, perhaps it's segregated when they brought it to the, the vendor, you know, or perhaps I didn't do a good job when I scooped it up or if they scooped it up in the five gallon buckets, or perhaps you didn't do a good job or we didn't do a good job in lab making sure it's a representative sample. So it is pretty important uh, when you're trying to meet specifications that your sample is representative. Okay, enough on that. Any questions? Good. Thumbs up, ladies. All right, how are we being? You guys good? Uh, last couple slides here. These are, the last slide or two are called special aggregates. So um, these are just some that are in your text um, that for, you know, maybe they're used for certain applications. So the first one is lightweight aggregate. So you can make lightweight concrete. We actually, uh, Besides this past year, we have the ASC has a competition where they make a concrete canoe. And while they do put some, uh, sometimes they put some styrofoam, you know, like little beads or things like that in it, but pretty, for the most part, you just don't put typical gravel and sand in it. And you make it with things like you can, uh, perlite and vermiculite and those kind of things that are in your notes. See that I'm not sharing that. There we go. So um, they're extremely lightweight. And so you can actually get, uh, let's just say a sample of concrete or concrete that is uh, lighter than the unit weight of water and therefore it'll float. Um, other uses for lightweight aggregates include insulation. So you can go uh, probably to Lowe's and I'm not sure what they carry, but I've got a big bag of in the, in the lab of uh, Zonalite. Um, if you remind me, I'll, I'll let you feel like a bag of it. It's just super light, uh, vermiculite or perlite, any of those, some of those are used for, are, are good, like uh, to put in uh, concrete masonry block or anything like that for as an insulative type of material. Um, fly ash, okay, that's the byproduct of burning coal. So uh, they don't like us burning coal anymore to make electricity, but uh, I think there's still some some coal-fired plants, I think up near Charleston, uh, Nitro area, maybe they still have one. Uh, so a byproduct of that, there's two byproducts when they burn the coal. Uh, one's called bottom ash. It's a heavier, um, it's more like a kind of a frothy, sandy type of material. So it's, 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 it's coarser than the fly ash, obviously. Um, they actually pump it with water into ponds and then they, it, it can be used, um, to as like a road base. Some people use it for that kind of thing. But fly ash is extremely fine, uh, like, a, like a flower consistency. And it actually wants to go up the stack with the emissions when they're burning the coal, but they have to trap it. And then um, th they actually have to landfill this for the, for the most part. Uh, I worked on a, the fly ash landfill down in Glenlyon. And um, they can take the fly ash, and especially if it's the right quality coal, so depending on the kind of the composition of the coal, and they can actually, you can substitute a portion of the cement with fly ash. Well, I mean, that's a great thing. And it actually has, it's actually beneficial to the concrete. It uh, helps with flexibility and longevity. Um, so if you can take a, you know, byproduct, something that you would typically have to throw away and replace the most expensive ingredient of concrete, which is cement, then that's a win-win. So uh, they, they do that. And if you want to Google that sometime, you can see uh, 
see all the different uh, applications. There's a lot of times that they do that. And we, I've got some flash uh, also in the lab. Uh, I think I've already covered the next one, per, perlite, vermiculite, zone of light. Those are super lightweight aggregates. Oh, I didn't say one thing. Uh, another application for a lightweight aggregate uh, that's pretty popular today is, uh, you know, this fake rock or stone that you see on a lot of people's house and inside those. So they have to use a really light aggregate for those as well because they're basically just sticking those to the wall. So they're not supported, you know, uh, underneath. So that's that's another good uh, use for that. I've got a good friend who uh, owns uh, MROC over on the other side of Peterstown, and he actually imports his uh, lightweight aggregate, I believe, from Alabama or somewhere like that. So it's kind of something that we don't have naturally around here, but uh, that's another good use for it. Lastly, on that slide are heavy aggregates. Uh, so contrary to lightweight concrete, sometimes you need like a counterbalance or something that's super heavy. Um, and so you can make obviously heavy weight concrete. So it'd be a lot heavier than 145 or 50 pounds per cubic foot. Um, and you can think of even like lead shot or, or some kind of iron or something like that. Um, radiation shielding, I don't know exactly what they use for that, but uh, in hospitals and medical facilities, um, they actually have rooms that the people that work there that are obviously exposed at a much greater rate than what somebody coming in to be treated or get an x-ray, they would need to have those rooms uh, constructed out of material that is definitely uh, shielded from the radiation. So that's where you might see something like that. Voila. All right. Uh, Everybody see me now? Cute. Anybody got any questions? That's chapter two. Um, I think I already assigned your homework and I posted that. We'll have a test in a couple weeks. And Wednesday we will start chapter four, not chapter three. We hop over that. So we'll actually start concrete next uh, Wednesday. All right. If there are no questions and feel free to email me if you have any questions uh, you guys have a great weekend remember no class monday and uh enjoy hey there take care everybody